Entertainment and the museum staff like to welcome you to the guided track tour. This is longtime Indianapolis Motor Speedway and IndyCar contributor Jay First, and I'll be your narrator as we take a lap around this historic facility. If on this site in 1908, we would be traveling through the fields of the old Presley Farm. The remains of this farmstead can still be found in the form of a barn situated behind the putting green of the Brickyard Crossing Golf Course outside of Turn 2. Most roads at that time were of poor quality and made it difficult for the early auto industry to create reliable products. Indianapolis entrepreneur Carl Fisher had the idea to build a facility where automobiles could be tested and races held for constructors to show off their new creations to the public. Fisher and his partners James Allison, Arthur Newby, and Frank Wheeler purchased this land for $72,000. As a result, in 1909, the Indianapolis Motor Speedway came into being. The first series of races on track had to be cut short as the original surface of crushed stone and tar proved unsuitable for high speeds. An idea was devised to pave the entire surface in brick. Work began in the fall of 1909. The project took 3.2 million bricks from around the state to complete. It was finished and ready for racing in just 63 days. Almost immediately, the track picked up a nickname relating to its new racing surface. Today, people around the world know of the Indianapolis Motor Speedway as the Brickyard. After two years of running races of varying length, Fisher and his partners decided it would be best to hold one epic race every year. The Indianapolis 500 was conceived to be held every May around Memorial Day. Ray Haroon won that first 500 in the locally constructed Marmon Wasp. It was a huge success, and the greatest day spectacle in racing was born. We enter the track between turns one and two onto one of our short shoots, each of which measure one eighth of a mile and are located at the north and south ends of the speedway. There are four turns, each a quarter mile in length from entrance to exit, and two straights, each measuring five eighths of a mile. Altogether, these add up to a total track length of two and a half miles. You are most likely beginning to feel the effects of our banking as we enter turn two, each of our turns, maintain their original 9 degrees and 12 minutes of banking, the same as in 1909. By comparison, Daytona International Speedway in Florida has 31 degrees of banking in its corners. The aerodynamics of Indy cars make them more suited to lower bank tracks. If you look to the left, some of the viewing mounds are coming into sight. These are located throughout the infield of the track and are used by general admission ticket holders. Coming into view on the right are the Turn 2 Suites. Constructed in 1973, these suites offer a close-up vantage point to the action on track for VIP guests and sponsors. As we ride along the back stretch, you'll notice that the surface is asphalt. This is the only change to the original layout. If you're wondering what happened to all of those bricks, most of them are still beneath us, buried under several layers of asphalt. You may now notice a golf course on either side of us. The original course was opened in 1929. There have been various configurations culminating with the major redesign in 1992 by legendary course designer Pete Dye. There are now four holes on the inside of the track and 14 beyond the back straightaway to your right. If Indy cars were on track right now, you would see them speeding by at roughly 235 miles per hour or 378 kilometers per hour. That would allow them to cover a football field in nine-tenths of a second. For safety purposes, we keep our buses restrained to a more leisurely pace. The Speedway has seen many forms of racing in its century-plus of existence. Hot air balloons and motorcycles held competitions even before automobiles took to the track. IndyCar, NASCAR, Formula One, and sports cars have all held major events here. Motorcycles returned in 2008, and even airplane races were held in the skies close to where we are currently touring. Coming up to your left is one of the more recent permanent additions to our facility, a quarter mile dirt track. This was installed in 2018 in part to honor USAC and IndyCar driver Brian Clausen with the BC39 Midget Car Race, held in conjunction with the Brickyard Weekend. This has become a premier USAC event with over 100 entrants in the first year. 
As we travel through turn three, be sure to look along the white walls on either side of the track. You will notice the SAFER barrier in front of the hard concrete. SAFER is an acronym for Steel and Foam Energy Reduction. This safety feature was developed by researchers at the University of Nebraska-Lincoln in conjunction with the Indianapolis Motor Speedway. It was first installed here in 2002. The safer barrier is responsible for saving many drivers from serious injury and can now be found at nearly all major racing facilities in the United States. If you look left, portions of the north end of the Speedway's road course will come into sight. Though early track renderings called for an interior road course, it took until the turn of the 21st century for one to finally be installed. The current layout measures 2.439 miles in length with 14 turns. Famed World War I flying ace Eddie Rickenbacker purchased the Indianapolis Motor Speedway in 1927. Captain Rickenbacker competed in the 500 before he learned how to pilot an airplane. He successfully guided the track through the Great Depression with no halts in racing. There were no events held here from 1942 through 45 as the result of World War II. Unlike the First World War, where the ground served as an aviation repair and refueling depot, the track was largely unused and began to be reclaimed by nature. At the urging of three-time 500 winner Wilbur Shaw, Terre Haute, Indiana businessman Tony Hallman saved the track from demolition in 1945, purchasing it for $750,000. Under Hallman George leadership, the Speedway prospered and became the worldwide icon known today. In January 2020, the track was sold to longtime race team owner and entrepreneur Roger Penske. Here we are on the front straight. A large portion of the 250,000 plus permanent seats can be seen. Combined with the viewing mounds, the Indianapolis Winter Speedway can hold upwards of 350,000 people. This means the entire population of Cincinnati, Ohio, or the country of Iceland, could find space to watch events here. The Indianapolis 500 holds the distinction as the world's largest attended single-day sporting event. You'll notice a wall separating the racing part of the front straight from pit. It was installed in 1957, and it may have been the first of its kind anywhere in the world. During the early days of the 500, pit stops would last several minutes. Modern crews can change a full set of tires and add fuel in less than eight seconds. Coming up on the left is Victory Podium and adjacent to it, the Pagoda. This iconic structure has 10 floors and its height is equivalent to a 13-story building. Open in 2000, it is the location for timing and scoring, master control, media broadcasts, and private suites. There have been various versions of this building dating back to the track's earliest days. Running through the pagoda and onto the racing surface is a link to the past, the yard of bricks. Every brick you see dates to the original surface in 1909. The front stretch remained predominantly brick until October of 1961 when the entire track was paved with asphalt except for this narrow strip. A unique tradition has developed involving the bricks. After winning the third running of the Brickyard 400 back in 1996, Dale Jarrett wanted to pay homage to the storied history of the track. Dale and his crew made their way to the yard of bricks, knelt, and gave them a kiss. This tradition is now performed by winners of every major event here at the Speedway.